hard to have faith in a person who says he is justified by faith alone, and he is not. Have you ever heard that? That sin was shut out of heaven, and he was dead by his sin. So he shuts it out. So we say it's accepted by faith. This means that there's an answer to our prayer. This means that there's a way to get back to God. That is why we say you need to get your heart right with the Lord. Peter, we say, tell us to study the Bible, to read the Bible, come to the church. We say the Bible is the truth of Scripture. It's important. It's inspired. It gives us hope. It gives us freedom. As well as the rise of the Islamic State separation, as the nation pulls from the fold of power and spreads to the gradual and extensive disputes of foreign society, and as well as the national security elements that we have to move during the time of the unrest, the unrest studies on issues of freedom of the world in Iraq, Afghanistan, on the Haitian border, and on the Islamic State in Haiti. Dr. Corson formally said that national security assistance. Thank you. 
people to come. They will catch up and there's very little clarity as to what they would take in. Uh, whether And whether or not successes and failures can be one part of the calculus when you go into the eighth grade of health system. Um, I certainly saw this when I was there a few months ago and two weeks ago I was carrying a panel on Afghanistan and NATO and the convenience of some of the senior members uh, of the international community and military and others and investigatory justice and so on. Um, I think similar to our flawed policy in Iraq, um, Afghanistan was far too reliant on international contractors as Karen had said earlier. Um, and each of these takes a slice of the pie along the way. One study noted that three quarters of international peace development assistance to this group came from foreign contractors. Um, one wonders what percentage of every dollar gets reallocated to those foreign contractors. Even, I think, in our more recent attempts to buy locally, we've heard a lot of people talk about buy locally and use local contracts. The U.S. government is still using its international contractors to pay the buying contractors back. Now, when I was there in early September, or late September, early October, I heard there were 400 Americans in the U.S. Embassy. They were bound to be an in-state piece of this plan surge. It seems to me that those Americans can go straight to the source and hire the contractors themselves and hire the Afghan contractors rather than go through uh, a number of international contractors. But what else could be done? Um, our goal here should be to ensure that Afghans are fully in need. That means in building security, building an economy, reestablishing government, governance, and weeding out corruption, um, as well as generating outrage and revulsion when Afghans and the Taliban actually kill the voters. Um, the international community really should be focusing on playing a catalytic facilitator and supporting the group, and in many cases, trying to mentor uh, the, the Afghan economic life in different parts of the government, the national and local levels, uh, in a very similar way to what the, the uh, international soldiers and administrators are doing, completely embedded in the government and spending most of their time working with the economic life. But also, I think our assistance needs to be much more direct and accountable. It needs to go straight to the people um, and to successful government programs. Um, I think, as uh, Ms. Ellison mentioned earlier, the National Solidarity Program is one great example. I think we should be far more supportive of the programs that are working. Um, now, of course, corruption is a problem. I think we all know that. And that's not just within the Afghan government, but it's also uh, among international donors. And here, perceived corruption can be just as bad as real corruption among international donors. Afghans hear about billions of dollars that are going into the country, but they often see uh, little result in egregious detail. Now, I think corruption can be reduced through greater transparency into all the money that's pledged and spent by them and by us. We can call it two-way accountability so that the Afghan people, as well as the taxpayers in all of our countries and all of the coalition countries, can see where their money is going. There are a number of ways to do this social media, through websites, um, and through other programs. We need to publicly suspend and monitor what we're spending. There's a great example of the Pakistan Development Network, which is already doing this up in the north of, of Afghanistan. They're working um, with the Shuras and training them how to treat and convert the part and social audits. There are other programs like that that we should be supporting. Now, this new approach, I think, to aid effectively should be directed by the United Nations. The United Nations has been mandated to coordinate the international donor community out there. It has not been able to realize its goal so far, but the United States needs to be far more supportive of UN efforts and to help the UN become more robust. Um, I think a more robust United Nations could be seen as part of our exit strategy along with a stronger Afghan national security group. The president could also consider appointing a high-level deputy to watch the whole situation and develop an accountability clause and make sure that monies that are pledged and spent are accountable and are going more directly to the people. And this could also apply, of course, across the border of Pakistan um, with the $7.5 billion aid package that was brought years ago to the country. Um, finally, I think Afghans need to hear that the United States is as committed to their welfare and security and we're not just concerned about the threat posed by al-Qaeda. I keep thinking that Afghans view the struggle as a common one, but they're not trying to unite in a war where they become full partners. I think we've seen the negative effects of this already in Pakistan. There's too many Pakistanis who want to see uh, their, own, their own struggle against the Kurds really as fighting an open war, not their own fight, even though it's, they're seeing greater attacks from different countries. So just to summarize, more direct aid, two-way public accountability, and a shared struggle with the Afghan people. 
difficult time today with some people that just can't work together. first comment uh, builds it a little bit on Dr. Blackenberg's comment about, uh, about the threat. In my view, um, th there is a very significant uh, uh, and serious threat to the U.S. homeland from the Afghan cyberspace front. U.S. intelligence is very clear about this. Um, we've seen it even recently with, uh, with individuals such as Haithoum Masood threatening um, uh, and supporting a terrorist attack in Washington, D.C. against troops. Uh, we, we also are aware of for the state, in my view, are very important. Second, uh, I think in general um, that there is little understanding among many, certainly in reading press accounts, of what is actually going on on the ground. There is a continuing oversimplification of this as a Taliban fight, talk of Taliban. In fact, when one gets into rural areas of the country, the situation is much more complicated. There are a range of militant groups operating in these areas, not just So, in general, we're talking about a very complicated insurgency that is not just a uh, Taliban insurgency by any means, um, and where motivations range from a senior level of the Taliban al Shura, a Giovanni ideology, to um, uh, financial motivations, uh, tribal motivations, grievances against the Afghan government, uh, a range of motivations that one doesn't know. The, the point, though, is that. Forces 
But this still leads us with a great question. What should that objective force us to be national? We should be rational. Now, actually, of course, we should be national. That is, are there solutions in these areas? Which one should be local for? Uh, and we have become a local from the range of options from Afghan to um, Afghan public protection program and Murdoch to uh, more traditional lock cards to all the time. So the argument here is there is no uh, magic number or number in Afghanistan. Uh, there's a lot of desire to see numbers. But I would say seven, over seven years into the counterinsurgency in Afghanistan, the U.S. clock is clearly ticking. In my view, uh, ultimately, um, this is not just going to be about uh, uh, building Afghan national capacity. In my view, this is also going to be about building uh, major capacity on sub-national levels, uh, in, including finding ways to work with uh, key sub-tribes, uh, some of which we know are sitting on the fence, uh, like the Al-Qaeda and the Al-Qaeda and the Indian Khans in the South, finding ways. And what I'm really talking about, without getting into detail again, is uh, I think uh, an important component of this is, is, is a much more sophisticated understanding uh, from the United States of local power, and frankly, rather than large numbers of American forces, uh, a, mu a much more significant focus on covert action and financing operations in rural areas to work with uh, local entities. Because again, I think we've seen some of the same results in rural areas as, as U.S. forces have deteriorated over the past year. Uh, I think this uh, gives me a great emphasis. I used to be in Haiti in 2001. In, uh, in uh, spending more time thinking about covert funding and operations rather than fighting on key forces and rather than using military force. Um, so uh, there are a whole range of other issues that came up during the questions on reconciliation in Pakistan, human rights uh, that I'm happy to address and that I'll run over the rest of it with. But I would just leave one with this, with this thought. The, the war in Afghanistan is now longer than the war in Palestine, uh, longer than the war in Haiti. Uh, the war that we're uh, spending now going on eight years. Uh, in Afghanistan, uh, in my view, uh, uh, we've already seen public um, uh, perception and support begin to uh, increase. I think that's probably likely to continue. So I would suggest uh, thinking a little bit more creatively about uh, how to take advantage of uh, uh, the range of issues that we very likely have in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. We are not in a state of strategy. We are losing it right now. And we're not losing it simply because of the kinetic results of the military action. Although, frankly, we're seeing 30 to 50 percent rise in casualties in force in the course of this last year. We're losing it for reasons we don't match them. We are seeing a steady increase in the expansion of Taliban not their influence. These measured in public opinion polls in the areas where they operate indicate they are not having the kind of unpopularity that they had in the past. And a lot of this is occurring because we do not have the presence. One problem we have, we do not have good intelligence on this increase in influence. We do not have the ability to map Afghan and Afghan violence. We describe these areas often as support areas because they are not combat. We don't want in them. And that has caused many of our assessments, badly understate what's happening in Afghanistan, and add to this the fact that we've been totally in analysis of Afghanistan and what is happening in Pakistan. And I say this because we have essentially probably two years in which to reverse this and in which we have to focus essentially on the war effect. Development, human rights, all of these things have to be done. But to do them with limited resources, simultaneously, and to combat those we face is not something that is possible. I believe that President Obama has outlined a concept that may well work. It has begun to allocate resources that may succeed. The fact is, however, that if we worked on this, we'd be the first to admit it. We do not yet have a strategy, a plan, a budget for 
knew him when he came to sinners, but he didn't do so. And what he wants is that one must. That is not an indictment to come in your office and lose your door. It's not something where you can instantly develop the kinds of plans and details that need to get. We now, at this point, have a plan which will load us up from what used to be 32,000 troops in naval ISAF to more than 70,000. We don't know exactly where it will go. We don't know how they'll be allocated to try to achieve a strategy which is now clear and bold play. We do not know how many will have to be used to aid one another, but many will. We do not know how many of the so-called fighters will have to stay in Hadith, but they will have to be appeased in every single Afghan battalion for at least several years. We do not yet have a clear, credible plan for building up Afghan forces. Our police efforts have been largely unsuccessful over the last seven years. We have some hope of what's called the Perfect District Development Plan, but it is far from clear that it's working. Only about 15% of the Afghan army units are yet able to achieve the highest level of readiness. They'll move forward, but it will be several years before they have to. I have to say I would join with what Dr. Van Hissel said, but I would make a stronger point about aid and echo what the Secretary of State said. We have seen a nightmare in the U.S. administration of aid. There's been no real coordination between AIT, State Department, and the Corps of Engineers. We cannot tie what we have said to the aid and measures of effectiveness. It has not been related to war. We do not have any of those kinds of things. And no one ties this together. That aid is critical, initially for war fighting and then for effective action. I have to say that I do not believe that the United Nations is deficient or any less corrupt or disorganized than we are. It has no audits, can't demonstrate what it has done, and the same is true of far too much of our aid activity. To win, we have to change it. But I think the most critical dimension we may really face is Pakistan. And I think that as we proceed during this tour, we need to look much harder at what is happening there because of all of the things that people have been working on in these strategy exercises. The highest thing that will win is trying to get Pakistan to cooperate. And here I have to say one of the problems that we grossly understate is the extent to which this is not a problem in the Kabul area or the Baluchis area, but a national problem inside Pakistan. We are not just talking about the renewed versus Ayah Rebellion fight. We're talking about Deoghandi movement, which exists throughout Pakistan. There has been classified study on segregation by the Crisis Group. There are other studies by Pakistan. If we cannot motivate the Pakistani public, if we cannot develop an effective presence in terms of Pakistani government, if we cannot change the map of what is happening there, I think most people would say we cannot win in Afghanistan. So we either have one strategy with very clear, detailed plans, which the Congress insists on monitoring, and seeing in terms of facts on the ground, not concepts. And we are going to spend the next two years probably wasting resources in those two areas. Thank you. Thank the whole panel. that the war in Afghanistan is taking a lot longer than the war in Hadith was even two. This is interesting, but I've also observed that in World War II, in each of the countries with whom we were at war, we only needed one guy to win. Very, 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 very
ceased to rain in Egypt. And I'm talking about the national leadership of Egypt. Put up a stone for me. Because I'm still sitting on my rock and I haven't seen the rain. And somebody else has to do that. I don't know that we could identify one person or ten people. And if those ten people surrendered, if this deal wouldn't still be going on, into the unforeseeable future. I guess the first question that has to be answered is based on this. We're really not a national war here. We're in in wars with entities, groups of people, and and varying interests. the insurgency. America's overriding interest is that there's some kind of national security. Some of that insurgency is not necessarily in and of itself a threat to America's security. But if it all combined up somehow, We had one half of our whole problem, and now since the since all of our eyes have been enabled to look to Israel and Afghanistan and Pakistan, and that's the new problem we have on our hands, and that's the ISIS problem. But love and marriage have seen that one won't the other. It can't be good. of the insurgency is what we would call a terrorist act, as opposed to what we would call the rise of ISIS, to which I have no objection. The real threat is when we all hook up and feed each other's lean tacos and feed off of each other. But all of the insurgency would become a terrorist act. The real threat that we're facing. How many people involved, percentage wise, are ideologically based other than in it for whatever they're in it for, which is this mischief that they're doing with their lives? I'm starting to think I don't believe in that very much. But uh, I'd like to hear you guys say how this seems to me that we have not just happened to God in the making of this whole nation. We have not. together in order to move and bring us back to people that could never come out of power and intelligence community to get very different views. And I think there is a clear recognition that much more needs to be done to fully understand it. But having said that, I think the word terror is very dangerous. Insurgents always create a threat. Mao is headed, we have made we have strong headed the Vietnamese main force division of that organized government during the Vietnam War even. But if, if I may just rephrase that, I think you're absolutely right. It, 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 is, it could have been branded as terrorism, which is what they thought of as one of the traditional terrorism that people terrorize their own people in a very power motive sort of manner. Now, the kind of terrorism that we're looking at currently is our ideological movement that looks to internationalize its problems and go beyond national traditional national order. Well, it's certainly been said to me that it's been more than just that. And I don't know how that's true. I think it's just that it's been studied into and how they influence 
images with much closer ties to the two main visions of the Taliban narrative of Russia and the Al-Qaeda network, that you will see a similar expansion of ties to the various Al-Qaeda bombing groups, Al-Qaeda bombing groups that play a major role in international terrorism already in Europe, in India, and other places. So what we are really saying is that we have a power vacuum of any kind in Afghanistan or Pakistan. You will see, I think, a steady expansion of international terrorist activity, even though these movements in the past have largely been national and are focused on their internal threats. personal view, uh, just starting from Al-Qaeda, and what Al-Qaeda has done, I think, fairly effectively to contain itself in, in, in an area, as, as uh, Tony mentioned earlier in your testimony, not just in the tribal areas or in Baluchistan, but also in a range of other places. Al-Qaeda has embedded itself in a range of militant groups, mostly Sunni, mostly Giovanni. So we know, for example, among Afghan insurgents, no Al-Qaeda connections, regular connections, meetings, assistance to Haqqani members, to uh, you know, uh, Muhammad Omar's Taliban organization. So we know that there is, so what that, that, what that broader series of uh, militant groups does is it provides an operative point for, uh, for Al-Qaeda in those areas, which poses a threat to us. And again, it's not just Al-Qaeda, as we've seen with the range of uh, uh, range of countries pretty recently, there are some uh, Uzbek militant groups, Jihadi group, for example, Haji Yadasha, who have posed a direct threat to a range of uh, U.S. ally countries in Germany, for some example, and other places. Um, now, uh, just to be clear about this, when we talk about the, these range of groups, including Al-Qaeda, which really doesn't play a major role in the actual fighting in Afghanistan, but its role is primarily in help. You remember the, uh, the German... Um, Pharmaceutical company, uh, Janafir Jabad, in Lebanon. He may have set a few years ago people named Alam al Sadat who died, who named Alam al Sadat who died badly. Now, Al Qaeda may be back in action, but it's pretty clear how it's back into the operation for the Afghan groups. Um, but what we see as we look across these groups, I would say, just in concluding, is that we see a lot of different interests in Afghanistan. Some of them have clearly fought against each other historically. We see Sheikh Mansah and the Taliban fighting. Not in the 1990s, they fought each other until Mr. Pasha had to flee from, from Afghanistan. So we have seen that there is a tension historically among some of these groups, and even some of the subclass that have been pointed out as originally the Taliban groups can actually fight each other historically. So by no means is this a democratic movement. Uh, variations in scope, how much it actually opposes jihad, some of the things are primarily even more parochial things. And again, um, I do think it's important, and Tony mentioned earlier, it's important to understand who is running these efforts. It's just far less than what they would call the guide and uh, how they cooperate and collaborate better. Perspective, the people of Afghanistan 
she did her laundry. That was one by word. The people of Afghanistan, we can make any deals we want with people in Pakistan and Egypt and Africa and their leadership in, in various countries and Iran and so forth. Well, we get right down to the village and the, and the provincial level in Afghanistan. They would not follow the orders and obey the deals that we make deals that we cut. Unless, of course, they are part of the decision-making process, including in Iran and Iraq. And, and Mr. Chairman, I need to ask you as one of the South of the Panthers today. Again, they keep talking about bottom up. Nobody can make a deal that can't be discussed. Nobody can talk about it. Is this administration willing to promote genocide that, that has been started for local people to elect their own people to govern them at the local level? District level, at the provincial level, or is this administration, as I have heard in the last few days, insisting that we be appointed from Kabul? And how do we expect you to enlist the people at the local level, tribal leaders or the other community leaders that exist and have no interest in being control of this, unless we are willing to have faith in the free election of local people to make their own decisions? So, are we going to permit local people to elect these people, or are we going to insist that they just have to accept the point and be sent by them? Well, I would suggest that we have to hold the local people accountable for their actions. I don't believe that you can hold local uh, provincial elections in the most southern provinces of this country accountable. The fact is that our PRC, the troop states that we have, only holds an extraordinarily limited role. When you have number of, let me go, before you go on, the caveat was in village areas, in, in village areas. Let me note very briefly on that, is that we understand where you can basically create the type of uh, stability and strength that may give us leverage on the areas that you're talking about. But instead, we insist on corrupt officials being accepted at the provincial level there just because they can handle our where there's too much chaos to uh, handle on our own. We have to do a cut ourselves on this. And, and let, me, let me say that I think that one of the rules that was not followed by the Bush administration and the Bush and Reagan administration prior to 2007, you do begin with local and provincial elections. The problem now is you've created levels of infiltration and violence that go far beyond the internal framework of the provincial system. And to hold an election would be extremely difficult. But if I may, I think in fairness, I don't believe the people developing this strategy put heavy emphasis on the regional approach. They were tempted, but they didn't believe it was sincere. I think they saw that the effect of Pakistan three key elements. One was building up Afghan forces in the process that would take at least two years. Another was to reinforce the U.S. and Allied presence at this point where you can shift to a win-hold-world tactic and strategy to promote threatened areas, bringing in aid workers to provide the health capability. I mean, I, I don't want to have a couple of minutes. Okay. Uh, sorry, uh, a couple of points that I want to make sure I get on the record this morning. Uh, number one, uh, it, it, what I see may not be as dramatic as things that certainly we are not going to have provincial and local leaders elected. Thus, we will then, of course, have them co-opted by, because we've put them outside the system. Uh, we're going to have corrupt officials being appointed by, by Kabul and state. The militias, we hear you are building up uh, a national force so that we can uh, pacify an area that sounds really familiar, doesn't it? Doesn't work. But in every one of these areas have local militias. When we drove the Pentagon out of Afghanistan, it wasn't us. It was the local militias of the Northern Alliance that drove the Pentagon out in the first place. And they might have instituted the Soviet Union. Uh, the plan of building up a, a centralized state will not work unless it includes the local militias. Are, are the local militias included in, 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 in the alliance? I don't see that. One last, um, uh, again, uh, I should have referred to the fact that these thoughts are on the record. Mr. Chairman, this is being fueled to one extent with dark money by finances used by other groups in Pakistan and in uh, Afghanistan. 
a foil in my meat by my good buddies, Ellie Schroeder and the Arab Brothers. And it's the toppings. And again, the ingredients that I have had on this plan de-emphasize, really think of it, de-emphasizes coffee eradication. And we have an option to get the micro-herbicide, eliminate those coffees, and they come forth with a whole very expensive operation to build their economy. That's the only thing that's going to work as far as what I can see. It's not going to be the new world of plan. The micro-herbicide needs to be addressed as far as what we're going to thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's no objection. I'd like to make sure I did not get to the point to the gentleman and the other person who was asking me the question. Certainly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, in addition to the president's speech, which we listened to, which was indeed a speech from the president, uh, which was accompanied by pictures, which probably got him a lot closer to the president. Small section of the including provincial and local governments in the capacity to the effort, and I was very grateful to you for what you would have done as president. I would think we need to work with the Afghan government to refocus the building assistance and capacity building programs on building up com- competent provincial and provincial and local governments where they can more directly serve the people and connect them to their governments. It doesn't specifically say elections, I think, but more what it says is that it's not linking with the local government. So I, I just want to make that very hard to know that if it doesn't say elections, and I won't I'll make the same mistake we did in Vietnam, where we sent the powers in from the, the capital and we expect them not to be correct. And they did it very smart. There's a center for in these developing countries where we send them out to take charge of the countryside. We end up turning people away from black local elections to make the people feel desperate and alienated from the people. So um, I thank the President. I don't want to divert from our guest from our panel and away from the important knowledge of the members of the group and the colleagues who probably been to the region more than the rest of us. Certainly, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you.
just two brief comments, uh, and I support uh, the direction that the uh, that the Mr. Robot is coming from in that in locally, uh, uh, focus on local power, uh, because I think in visiting a number of times rural areas in the south and east in particular, um, we actually if we can read our federal bottom up model that was done in Georgia in the late 90s and 2001, again not just Northern Alliance for the north. Uh, but also uh, U.S. intelligence and special forces operating in the South, working with public life side, uh, the public life side, and uh, sub side, for example, the Kandahar, the Talib side, the Russian side, of it, um, recognizing the inherent local dimension of power. One also uh, has to realize that the Taliban strategy, campaign planning, the tactics, techniques, and procedures in the areas they operate, especially in the South, is a bottom up strategy. We have pursued a top down strategy. They have pursued a bottom up strategy. I would argue it's been more effective in rural areas than it's been in our country. They approach the range of tribes and sub tribes and clans. Um, I think what will be interesting along these lines is uh, uh, monitoring the U.S. Embassy in Wadah province, where it's now in its first effort to, uh, to try to uh, put together a bottom up strategy. The other thing that I would note very briefly in talking about democracy. In top two areas of the country, again, the primary areas where the insurgency is happening, we do have government appointed district sure, uh, sorry, uh, district governors and provincial governors. But we also have a, a, what you might call the Pashtun version of democracy, which is the, the Durga or the Shura at the village level and at the district level. And these are their uh, tribal clan representatives. So I would say, in addition to thinking about elections, as I was pointing out earlier, in a new secure environment that may be problem, there is a form of, uh, of uh, Pashtun democracy that is what's called the Shura or the Durga. And, uh, and in my personal view, we have not successfully done a good understanding of who to work with uh, that portion of uh, Pashtun society that is somewhat democratic. Thank you. If I could just get a confession. Is it me that has to ask for what you're saying, or do you have to tell me? Well, I mean, just the record that I mean, the actual government and uh, the office of the Attorney General. If you look at 2001, this was a combination of local and U.S. Senate against private and federal forces. begin to build up local authority, local loyalty. Whether the ideas people are looking at will some find a variation on what they have in Vietnam by way of local security forces. But the truth is that as yet, we do not have those high levels of administrative requirements. And given the number of U.S. troops we intend to deploy, it will only affect the most critical pieces of Kemet during the course of 2000. on these prior themes, I wonder if you all would offer your views on uh, how well the United States, and, and this, I'm, I'm not really talking about the, uh, the Afghan federal government so much, but I'm talking about things under our control here, uh, how well the United States can integrate in a local, national, political type of arrangement. So the United States, for example, and it's been written to later for this piece here about the alliance and the historical alliance that actually is at the local level, but there's no way that we can integrate more at the national level. How well can these efforts be integrated for uh, national good and security if we you know, have this sort of approach? Mr. Johnson, you can first. Sure. Uh, you know, just, just to briefly respond to how the country is integrated, uh, an area that I've been to a number of times is uh, the uh, Sadabad area of Kumar province. And I think where the U.S. has been effective along these lines PRC and Punak have been under a range of different Navy commanders, actually, uh, who have backgrounds in general in uh, commanding ships. It, 
that um, to work both with the provincial and the district governors in Puna, which is uh, the provincial governor is uh, local to Wapiti, and then in key areas to sit down with the village level and the district level and get their concurrence to, to understand what are the primary needs. So I'll give you one example. There's a, there's a lot of uh, 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 agricultural activity in Puna. There, there are basic problems in getting goods to market in a perfect amount, so, so one of the, the issues that was identified as the locals is road construction for a very specific economic purpose, to get goods to China. So what the PRT did, and the ranging region people, including Commander Larry Lagree, sit down with the ranging villages and that region, see if this was something they, they wanted, and employ their, uh, their uh, villages in the construction as it went through their area. That gave them a group involved in, in uh, planning it, state involvement actually doing it, and state involvement actually protecting it. So I think where we've done it effectively, that kind of model has actually been very useful. And again, there was input from the national government level. Um, yes, Dr. Jones, is there a map on that table that perhaps you could put into the record and share around how we can start to describe it this effort? Uh, I don't believe it's been written up anywhere. This is the, uh, it, it, it's a question. Would, would you mind volunteering to that record? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, I'm serious. It really would be helpful if you could sort of describe that. You know, we're looking for ways forward, and I think one of the problems is that no one really knows exactly what to do. And so we're going to help try to to look for that uh, collectively and not necessarily what it is in the print. And also, I would like uh, the unanimous consent to put an article into the record. This is a document uh, prepared by the United States Institute of Peace, and it is entitled Killing Friends, Making Enemies, Poland, The Impact and Avoidance of Civilian Casualties in Afghanistan. Are you all familiar, yeah, are you all familiar with this document? You know, could you all talk for a moment, uh, perhaps uh, Dr. Jones, a little bit about what it means when we, in an effort to uh, eradicate uh, a violent, hostile uh, person, um, do that, perhaps, but also put a whole lot of other people like uh, Reverend Carter and stuff like that. What does it mean? What's the impact of that? Well, first, uh, with all due respect, I think it is a terrible mistake to think that we can write a deal with the Russians. I think what we are saying, Dr. Jones pointed out, when we have been able to put together PRT and troops that provide security, where we win kinetically and defeat the enemy and then provide security, rather than go in and fight again and again with civilian casualties and losses and humiliation. When we bring in jobs, when we bring in some kind of I'm sorry, Dr. Jones, no, I that works. But you those are the I do control the time, and I want to thank you for your clear explanation, and I appreciate it. But, I, I mean, I've heard you say what you seem to be saying, and I, I listen to you pretty carefully. But I would like to just get some, something on the record, if somebody would, about what what the casualties mean, what they do. And I'm going to go to Dr. Van Hipple because I think she may be the one that can answer that question. Well, there is a very complicated uh, area of the legal document that I think some of you have worked on this program when you sent the government entities that we need for their assistance. We think the way we have the the Afghan federal border, the Pakistan federal border, and North Korean federal border. Because if one stretch are killing civilians, but we're not fully admitting that we're doing it on the Pakistan side of the border, we do need to get those civilian casualties. We need to protect the population. That's the point of having these bridges. Well, uh, yeah, Dr. Jones. Uh, this, this is a question of focus, but it is talking about a disaster. And, and killing civilians is not by itself a core tenet of uh, Pakistan society. So, from a cultural standpoint, civilian casualties by nature uh, need to be met with protection. So that's the kind of mind, cultural mindset that we fall into. And frankly, the Taliban too is a suicide attack. They, they run from space to get there. So there's a cultural tradition that we work in as well. If I may, I'll run out of time. Uh, but I was reading it as I was trying to form my own views on the subject, at least on the I ran into some uh, material uh, about what the Netherlands was doing in the oil sand. And again, you, you all have information way above my head, and so I don't, unless I was computer glitchy on what I wrote, that you'd be a map. But 
Can you talk about I read in, in the, about the gut of in, in the world around it? They haven't had the two big pieces. They, they haven't had a quite bit of success as organizations. Can, can you offer your views on, on how the gut is looking at it? Because any city could be in the gut, but we might look at it. Mr. Gunn, Dr. Gunn, excuse me, over the next five minutes. Some of the struggles who are there. I, I would say there still has been a problem in understanding and looking at local entities and what they think. So I think the Dutch have faced the same problem that the British have had and the Canadians have had in the South, which is uh, working with local entities. I do not believe the Dutch have succeeded in uh, 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 stabilizing the Dutch government right now. And I think I'll take care of it, guys. And I'll, I'll talk. Um, and I'm also uh, impressed by how quickly they have played Afghanistan against them. Um, a friend who served in Iraq um, was talking to me recently about comparing Iraq to Afghanistan because of the longer term prospects. And he pointed out Iraq has um, water and the ability to sort of do most of the heavy lifting. Water, maybe the most mountain passes, um, it sort of lends itself to um, small systems and not a unified governing structure. Um, and um, it sort of makes it natural to a variety who would be involved in illegal drug trade. So that the money would move on to another part of the map. Um, so you want to have a pretty high value crop, a high, high value crop, um, or there's no guys in the world. So I'm, I'm comparing those two because there's really some reason to hope that there's a way to unify that country and, and not have it experience the Soviet kind of failure. Um, but eventually there's no way to win it. Up in national capital. 
so now we're talking about putting in enough ammunition, putting in enough troops, building up Afghan forces while we build up government at the local level. And if we can take the examples we've had in the East and move them to the South, then, as the strategy I believe calls for, we have some chance of success. As the people I know who help organize this would say, it will be a short-term thing. Nobody can guarantee that the transplant will win, but there is a reasonable chance we can provide that level of security and stability. There is hope. I mean, there are. I think part of what 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 you need to do is look at the period in Afghanistan's history where it has been stable. You know, a lot's changed. There was a lot changed. There was a Soviet period, then there was a civil war, then the early 1990s, then the Taliban years. But one thing I would say has historically been true of when stability has occurred in Afghanistan, for example, between 1933 and 1973, during the Zakir Shah period, you had a central government that could establish order and deliver services in urban areas of the country along two roads, and, and, and South Drive, Dome, the Bush, and then rural areas, some of those that, that cooperation between the two was even better. Better, I would say, if you had central government that you could establish order in rural areas. I just have one more question. There's something that strikes me. One of the extraordinary challenges within developing aid world is this thought of, within developing aid communities, where it's literally the great thing is that tool that does exist, it's made the tech of sense. And so, you know, there are enormous challenges, but I, I would agree with um, what you said in terms of that if we can provide basic services, if we can check the people, and, and basic help them build up justice and other uh, you know, rule of law at the local level, we don't need to worry as much about it from the They will be very happy to bring it up to us at the local level. And, you know, I think it's for us to recognize that too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to open statement and hope that whatever happens in the statement will be used against me in the case of the case. If you support President Karzai, he has already filed a motion for re-hearing the case. And, you know, we'll be waiting for a decision. But if there's someone else, I guess my question is, uh, you know, the corruption issues and, and uh, the executives refusing to part with the U.S. Air Force, is there someone else other than President Karzai that could do a better job? Because the Afghan people are facing what they need to be tackled with this administration, this administration. We knew that person, they'd know his name, and he'd be running the state possibility. If they don't know the name, it might be the same thing for them. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I want to just say that the call for the Obama administration to support the Secret Service Democrats actually means several things. I think that it's easy to appear that the Secret Service is in favor of President Tehran and Canada and some others. But for, especially for the democracy in Afghanistan, we have several countries who have several people. Possibility to get this, but you know, whether or not Karzai or someone more quickly will be part of it, and hopefully, we'll, um, we'll have countries leading the Secretary Democrat to do that. Certainly, I would just come back to my same question again, but I'm just going to go back to the, the local population is at the center of gravity in Afghanistan, and that means what we don't know, we don't have good public opinion polls that are telling us the full picture of the war that we have had. And, and 
But again, I don't think it's new exposition. This has to be supporting the process, not supporting some of the things. It has to be, it has to be a local initiative to see what needs to be done in the town. I think that is the only way to get that done. Yeah. It sounds like what I do when I go to one of my union halls and I'll stand up and say, you elect whoever you want to be president and I'm going to work with you. And uh, Sometimes that makes that seem like the union politics. But maybe that's what we need to do because we know the problems that some of these fellows have in the town. It's brother and family with the lack of support of organizations. Again, some of the arrangements between the private sector. And again, I don't want us to start from this continuation that the African people have enacted. But anyway, thank you. First is, um, in my first experience, there's something that a lot of these families have done. The use of surf um, essentially originally intended to augment the resources available in the very high market in the town to help complement the work they're doing by winning hearts and minds and helping them survive poverty and rural life or do some of the other health things. Those homes have grown, as I understand it, from about $26 million a year to projected $900 million. That would make a surf what you know, if it were a bilateral rent program, one of the biggest in the world. Um, what's, your, what's your take on whether this is maybe a broom in which we put a. Because I'm not at all convinced the military makes the best folks in urban development programs. And they do many, many things well, but we may be asking them to be more productive than just be speculating. Thank you. 
we are seeing that a new church most effective is something like the Baptist Integrated Civilian Leader or Church Decision. Um, what a USA ID to figure out ways to get its funding bigger um, and, uh, and, and, and to minimize the use of international contracts for Indian American money might be also a real USA ID. If you're not troubled by the fact that our military technology is tons of the money to buy a better on the fact that we have something that can change it, yes, you can do Many of those never started on their second or their third year of service. The PRC, which we talked about, again, an 83 force in the department, and had over 1,000 members there that was from 40 to 50. Those are the people in the forward areas and in the high risk areas. The HPC, the other interest, they have limited personnel, but it moves them. They're talking about surging leadership in them, but they would have to then have equal responsibilities. And they won't be there under the command to a certain extent. And they're fighting now. So these are grim realities. I don't like these numbers, but they are the reality we have. And if we're going to win, we have to break them. My time is up, Mr. Chairman. I would like to take some issue with this question. Because the issue is not how many force do we have. The issue is the veterans that compete with the best they don't have. Systems. And I think we're going to pay the hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. We're talking very different than what the American people want. Uh, and the original mission of CERC has changed fundamentally. That's the question. Not whether you know, our military is using their job is using them, not the target to be in front of us, but whether they have the resume and expertise, and whether we really want to add that burden to an already full plate of our military. Thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me then not sure if it's exactly the topic line, but did you, um, in your testimony, indicate where you said about 1,030 forces in Afghanistan? Um, I, I did. I did based on uh, uh, the exact count in each, based on the uh, uh, Vince Clay of uh, uh, Field Manual uh, Toolkit. And would those um, include Afghan forces as well? Well, that's a pretty difficult question. I would suggest that if you use those ratios, that's what's required, if you use those ratios. Combination. So you're, you're not pinpointing what troops, you're saying combination. Yes. Could be Afghan, could be NATO, could be U.S. Could be Afghan national, could be Afghan military. Right. And, and, and foreign. Foreign. Right. That's, that's our question about how we want to use them. Oh, that's, that's a huge number. <laughs> that's a big number. That, that's a big number. Um, and your, your basis for that is what? Containment and then security ongoing? How long would that, would you think that would be a problem? So the focus would be uh, protecting the local population. Uh, how long that would take is, uh, is an open question. The average length would take to win a conversation is 18 months. So. And um, you don't uh, sense the comfort and support of the present administration in Afghanistan. Is that something you think that that would be acceptable, acceptable right now? Well, I think if, uh, 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 if most of those forces were active military, uh, army, uh, army police and local forces, yeah. Do you see any um, inclination in the present administration in Afghanistan to agree with that? Uh, well, the first test case for this is, uh, is war on progress. We're looking at those people who are very local forces. So uh, I don't think we have a focus on that right now. And then local forces funded by the central government or organized by the local government. They can directly be associated with the federal government. So, yeah. so it's easy to the central government. What do you think would be the impact of that kind of force on the main, our neighbor, uh, Afghanistan, as well as Pakistan? I think it's intended to stabilize the uh, uh, country. Um, I think it would be, it should be negatively impacted. Do you think it has uh, there's some negative impact in terms of that larger force on their, on their border? Uh, shouldn't. I mean, if they're uh, local, uh, one thing that, that I'm quite sure of in Afghanistan is that it's not a uh, lack of uh, guns and ammunition and weapons. So, uh, we, we so you're talking about an organized security force so that it can be stabilized, the recruiters can go to school, right. uh, others can be, um, you know, the Congress can function. Uh, I had the, uh, the, the unfortunate uh, 
I think when you hear from women parliamentarians, it's difficult to go back to their constituents or projects. Thank you very much. Of course, as you have just indicated, the labor of Pakistan is falling apart. Uh, what then is the nexus that we need to have between the restoration of Afghanistan and Pakistan? I don't think it's falling apart. I think it takes leaps and bounds to make it successful, hopefully, as well, in trying to maintain that component. But so there is hope. There is hope, definitely. And would you say that changing the army chief of staff or changing the structure of it? I think that ultimately the real focus of Pakistan now will have to melt as well as the most of the Persian Gulf into a successful stable kind of government structure. And the military can become a military that. Can we help them with that with legislation that focuses on democratization and social needs? We can try to help them. It has really had much impact to the point that we know that the Pakistan economy is in fear of this. Well, let me say that I think we do have a way of uh, strengthening those uh, democratic ideals that I believe we cannot survive if we don't have a regional policy between India, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. Uh, that I believe that uh, this committee has had the tools, and I thank the chairman for yielding to me. I look forward to working with him on the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if we could take another three minutes for the one speech to ask to have you answer the question which we would have asked you in person or exercise the honor that you think you can take in your own time. Well, let me begin, Mr. Chairman, by saying that I had the great pleasure of being here. I gave a lot of uh, various uh, examples of the Pakistan state, but we need to actually measure what are the strategies that we need to so we need to know from the past. So we've had almost no meaningful reporting and accountability in what we now call the AFCON to find out whether the president's strategy is being fully implemented and actually working. I think the elements are there, but it is a grim fact that the administration for seven years has not provided meaningful reporting on what's actually happened in those states. It's also a fact that in conflict, without detailed plans, without detailed metrics for their success, without even a clear picture of the cost, if we are to be successful by the summer of this year, we need to know what is happening, we need to see real progress, and we need to be able to monitor it and see it more efficiently in the course of these years. Let me make one other point. For this entire time, there has been no real effort within the State Department to tie together the U.S. aid effort, the international aid effort, provide accountability, and any kind of real responsibility. How do you solve this? Make the Deputy Secretary personally accountable for the failures in the dealing with aid, not only in the State, the Department of Defense. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, any questions? Sir, I have one. Uh, very briefly, the rogue neighbor, we danced around it a little bit. Uh, I, I think what needs to be understood is that the foundation deal with is an issue that are causing a great deal of insecurity among the major Afghanistan's major neighbor countries. It's serious tensions between India and Pakistan which is um, uh, impacting the security of Afghanistan. If the Indian pool is being built on the Afghanistan-Pakistan border, it's being built in the Kakowitz. This causes deep insecurity among the Pakistanis. I think we have to do a much better job of addressing it at the strategic level, causes of insecurity between states. Um, we have now Marines that are going to be operating on the, U on the Afghan Iranian border that are also causing tension. My point here is uh, there are a range of steps that might be to be taken to decrease um, uh, tension among the major powers in the region. Uh, and that is uh, uh, Rebecca Holbrook's uh, job. But I think there are a range of things we can do. The only last thing I'll say on neighbors is we have members of, Pac of the Taliban Kumatura operating country who openly is Quetta and Karachi. How, how can we continue to let that happen? How can senior members, whether it's Kareber or Omar or Bashir, continue to operate openly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like 
that you you touched upon a little earlier about changing the paradigm from a very heavily uh, contractor driven development uh, program that's just never really worked in Iraq and it's not working in Afghanistan. And you don't need to spend nearly as much money as you were spending there in making this work. You need to get more aid directly to the people. Um, and I think we need to put a lot more pressure on these international partners to work very closely with us and to build up the capability of the UN so that they can make sure that everybody is seen as included in this kind of work. Thank you.